Deion Sanders and the Colorado Buffaloes have a big season ahead of them. What does 2024 look like after a very interesting 2023? We'll take a deep dive into the Colorado Buffaloes to see what we should expect in 2024. Before we do that, though, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, like the video, share the video. It goes a long way and help the channel and this deep dive series. And it's going to be really fun to see how much we can grow this channel and, and see how far this deep dive series can go. It's been really fun so far. Let me know who else you want to see. And without further ado, let's dive into Colorado in 2024. Last year, obviously, was very interesting. Deion Sanders comes in and definitely got a lot of attention and well-deserved. And regardless of if it was positive or negative, they definitely earned all the attention that they got. And you got things off to a really exciting start and then kind of crashed and burned a little bit and finished with the four and eight season. I think that's kind of what most people expected. And there's still plenty of optimism surrounding this program. Dion's doing a great job of, I know, there's two sides to Dion in terms of how fans and the media view him. You have the one side where it's just, oh, it's all glamour and they just want all this attention. It's all for clicks and whatnot. And while there is truth to that, I think that Dion is doing a good job of sending messages to his kids that are, this is what we expect, you know, from keeping the locker room clean to, you know, doing the right things, doing, you know, making the right choices, little things like that uh, in terms of, you know, wearing the right colored socks or doing the right rep, those kind of, you know, he's doing all these things to try and build a program that is a winner. And I have to at least, you know, tip my cap to him because I, I think that he's doing the right thing. He's just doing things differently than really any coach that we've ever seen. And that's going to ruffle some feathers. That's going to get a lot of attention. And when you look at what this team did last year, the offense obviously had plenty of potential, but the defense struggled a ton. And they once again went to the transfer portal to, I don't want to say solve all of their problems, but they definitely figured out, hey, we need a ton of talent. We need an influx of talent on both sides of the ball, and they continue to do that. Now you see a little bit more stability. The offense has a lot of exciting players that we'll dive into, but it's going to be the defense that we all keep an eye on. But again, when you bring in some of the talent that they did, this should be a better group, and we'll dive into what the schedule should look like later in this video and what we think in terms of predictions. But for now, we're going to start with – the transfer portal and it's impossible to list all of the players that Colorado not only lost, but who they gained. And some of the bigger ones uh, should pr produce plenty of excitement. And there's a reason why this should be a really fun group to watch, especially defensively too. Savion Riley comes in from Vanderbilt. That was a late addition from the transfer portal. Uh, Chidozi and Wanko, you're looking at someone who, is very underrated in college football. I don't think a lot of people know his name. They don't know what he's capable of doing. He just needs to stay healthy. If he stays healthy, you're looking at a guy who's going to be a force. And he's a little bit undersized, but he has the power and the explosiveness that will make life very difficult for anybody that's facing him. You also bring some potential guys where it got, you're kind of banking on what they could do. A guy like Quincy Wiggins comes in, and you look at someone who's going to be able to yeah, you know, get, he's going to get his opportunity to showcase what he's capable of doing. And you're going to have to do that in a talented group. Everybody's competing for a job. Everybody wants to a piece of the pie. And with the number of transfers that you're bringing in, you're going to have to stand out in a big way. Nalen Hayden comes in from Ohio State. That was kind of a surprise. Also sent a couple of running backs hacking. So that hurt a little bit. But you have a guy who was sitting behind you know, some good running backs at Ohio state and now gets a chance to be the guy for Colorado. Deion Hayes made some interesting comments about his former team in Pitt and how he didn't think that he was going to win there because the offense wasn't up to speed. I don't think he's going to have any issues with that at Colorado. This offense should fit his liking quite a bit. And there's a lot of reason to be excited for this offense defensively. Also add guys like Graham Buell, DJ Green, DJ McKinney, Samuel Okunlola. We'll talk about those guys in a little bit. The, the moral of the story is that you should be excited. This isn't just, oh, we got a handful of players that are really exciting, and then we just added 
you know, kind of quantity over quality. I think this this transfer class was a little bit more quality over quantity for Colorado, which is really exciting. When you look at some of the losses, it depends who you ask. Some of these players, you know, you lose Dylan Edwards. That's a big loss. I don't care what anybody says. That's a big loss for Colorado. Getting Dalen Hinton was obviously great, but losing Dylan Edwards definitely hurt. Ultimate Caskill is also a, a good running back, despite what his stats say at Colorado. He's someone who at Arizona State is going to do a lot of good things. Romani McLean, if he finds the right fit at Florida, then I think that he'd be really good. Obviously, Dion stated that he hopes that he he wishes the kid nothing but but good things going forward. I think it just wasn't the right fit for Kamani. And, and obviously, Colorado is just moving on as well. Again, this is a, a program that has been under the spotlight quite a bit, which is really fun because when you look at Colorado, even when they were having some of their good years in years past, no one really talked about them the way that you did right now or even last year. And this is a team that went four and eight. I think that people need to keep that in mind outside of Colorado is that we're talking about a Buffalo's program that's been at the bottom of the Pac-12 for so long. Now you join the Big 12, so that's going to be a different challenge. But the fact that they were four and eight and still on everybody's mind is saying something. Now, if you find a way to win a, make a bowl game, show that you're taking a step forward, you know, where there are some things we'll discuss after the season, but think about how much we're going to talk about them. And I think that's really fun. I think that's really exciting. It brings a lot of excitement to the Big 12. That's definitely a selling point for their conference, their new conference, their new old conference, if you will. But this offense is going to be a big reason why this team has success. And it, there's a big X factor that we'll talk about in a little bit. But everything starts with Shadur Sanders, and for good reason. When you look at what he did last year, over 3,200 yards, 27 touchdowns, only three interceptions. One thing you'd like to see from him is how to make quicker decisions. Not that he can't make them. It's just that he kept plays alive for so long. A lot of that had to do with the lack of time he had to stand in the pocket and throw. But you should trust your team a little bit more this year where if it's not there and you don't have to make an all-world play, uh, you just, you know, you can throw it away. You can, you know, I think that you're looking to live to fight another doubt, whatever. Yeah, Shadura does a really good job of making throws, but I think at times he is trying to be a hero. And this year, I, I don't think that Colorado needs him to – be a hero as much i don't think that he needs to to do those things you don't need to to be that guy because you have guys around you that can make plays now we're going to see that early on we're going to see him take a a step forward in his development in his progressions but you're also going to see him try to do some of the old things and old habits are, are going to have to move on. You're going to have to find a ways to trust your teammates. That's really going to be a big thing here. And I'm sure Dion's going to tell him that too. You need to trust your guys. Your guys are making plays. The guys in front of you are doing what they can. And it's different than last year. This isn't last year's team. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind. If you're a fan, if you're a media member, but also within Colorado's program, this is not last year's team. This is a different team. And until further notice, you have to, you have to trust that you have to trust teammates around him. And that falls a lot on Shadur, but it's easy to see why some of these things are going to be hard for him. We talk about the offensive line. We'll talk more about them in a little bit, but the rushing attack is probably why Shadur felt the need to make so many plays. Bringing in Dalen Hayden makes life a little bit more uh, beneficial, makes it a little bit easier. And this is a group that struggled running the football last year. So you have to find ways to move the ball on the ground. Depth probably is a question for Colorado at this position. Michael Welch comes in as a freshman, could be a, a contributor early on. And Isaiah Agustave comes in from uh, Arkansas, could be another guy that steps up. But again, mostly unproven for those two guys. Hayden, now that he gets a full season in front of him, we'll see what he can do in terms of what the ceiling can look like. But again, you find more balance then this offense will be a much better group. And that's saying something because when you watched this Colorado team last year, this was a really fun team to watch. This is a really exciting offense to pay attention to. And it's easy to see why 
this group could be much better because if you saw what they did last year on top of the fact that they were very imbalanced and relied on the passing attack so much, if you find a rushing attack and you find a little bit more balance, this is going to be a, a much tougher team to beat. Now, that being said, the passing attack is going to be as electric, if not more electric than it was last year. Travis Hunter obviously returns. He is going to be one of the most talked about players in college football. Playing both sides of the ball is really what I mean, playing both sides of the ball at altitude is really just insane. If you ask me, because when you look at what they expect him to do and the fact that he's doing it at a high level says a lot about what he's going to have in terms of a career. And there was the question about, is he a better corner? Is he a better receiver? I don't really care. I think that he is just so fun to watch on both sides of the ball. It doesn't really matter which one he's better at because he succeeds so well, so easily on both at both positions. 721 yards, five touchdowns last year. You also bring in some talent to help you out with a little bit, but you also return some talent that's going to help you as well. Will Shepard was an underrated addition, if you ask my opinion. The fact that he did what he did at Vanderbilt says a lot about his talent level. And, you know, six foot three, 198 pounds is going to be fun to throw to downfield. Shitter is really going to like that. Had 684 yards and eight touchdowns last year at Vanderbilt. In the SEC, that says a lot. This team, the Vanderbilt team, I should say, had some talented players that maybe didn't get the love they deserved. But now you're getting chances at other schools. Obviously, that stinks for Vanderbilt. But Will Shepard should find that life in this offense is a little bit easier than the one he had with Commodores. Jimmy Horn Jr. is back once again. Guy with a lot of speed. And I'd like to see him and his average go up a little bit. Had 58 catches last year, 567 yards, which is a 9.8 yards per catch average. You'd like to see him be a little bit more explosive but he's definitely someone that is capable of doing that. The tight end position is a little bit more unknown. Sam Hart is going to be the starter there for sure. Uh, no production, but we'll see what happens there. Again, there's still some questions with this passing attack, but it's still going to be a much better group than it was last year. Even when you lose uh, Xavier Weaver, that obviously hurts, but I think this group will be better than it was last year. Omarion Miller, super slept on player. Obviously, the USC game was his coming out party, but didn't really have much production outside of that. 234 yards, averaged 21.3 yards per catch. But again, it's kind of mostly just that one game, and then you didn't really hear about him outside of that. Two transfers that will play a big role. Uh, LaJonte Wester coming in from FAU, had a big year for the Owls, and again, could be a menace when Jimmy Horn needs a little bit of a break. Wester is one of those guys that can step out over 1,100 yards, eight touchdowns. Uh, another guy to keep an eye on, Cordell Russell, not as proven as a producer, but the TCU transfer should be a really fun player to watch. Again, the depth at wide receiver should be really, really exciting. But none of this is going to be possible if one position doesn't take a step forward, and that's the offensive line. This is an offensive line that we talked about time and time again last year about why they're struggling so much, what's going wrong, how do we fix this, what does this offense need, how does Shadur trust his guys, and it all lies with the offensive line. And everybody knows that. Colorado knows that. College football knows that. But I think this group, if they can gel, has a lot of potential. And when you're looking at the guys that could be starting – there are a handful of players that aren't in this starting lineup that are definitely going to factor in that are going to compete. And that's what Dion wants. He, he's been pushing competition ever since he got there, pushing that everybody wants to make each other better. And nobody's going to benefit from that more than this offensive line. Jordan Seaton was a huge addition in recruiting. The freshman from Washington, D.C. at one point wasn't expected to come to Colorado. And now he is with the Buffs. He is going to get his first taste of college football. And a lot of, uh, of Colorado's success could hinge on his ability to handle that transition. Now, he joins a group that is pretty much all brand new. Tyler Brown's experience followed beyond from Jackson State. But you're looking at someone who is going to get pushed by a guy like Tyler Johnson. The Houston transfer had a, a good run with the Cougs. 
and now he's going to push for starting time. Clemson transfer Zach Owens is an ex- experience, but has a great frame that's going to put him in position to make plays. The other guard, Justin Mayers, a, a really good player from UTEP. But again, playing at UTEP in Conference USA and playing in the Big 12 with Colorado is going to be a transition. So keep that in mind. Uh, center position is really interesting to watch. Shakiri Walker from UConn. Again, another Transferring from UConn to Colorado means you're going to need some time to to transition. But again, if all of this goes well, there's a, a lot to be excited about. And then finally, at the the tackle position, position, Hello Benson, Philip Houston, two guys that will be competing with Jordan Seaton. We'll see who ends up being at that rotation. But I think you have to feel better about the talent level because this is a group that was one of the worst in keeping their quarterback upright keeping him protected and that has to change if you're Colorado you cannot accept having the production that you did last year the lack of consistency the fact that Shadur was hit more than almost any quarterback in college football sacked more times than any quarterback in college football you're looking at someone who definitely needs his guys to step up and again that we talked about this earlier if Shadur is going to trust his teammates the offensive line obviously has to be one of those groups that steps up and plays better. And Shadur is not going to trust them right away. For the first month, it's probably going to take a while, and there's going to be a lot of growing pains because you need to figure out what's working, what's not. And Shadur is going to expect that things aren't working more than they are. So you're going to have to give him some time to get acclimated to the fact that his guys are doing their job and find a way to get that process going quicker because as soon as you're able to get him to trust you this offense is going to take a step forward and be more balanced and be really fun to watch now the other group and this is an entire unit is the defense this was one of the worst defenses in college football and i don't know if you necessarily just say oh well we brought in new talent so that's going to work that's going to make everything better I don't know if necessarily know if you can just say that. I don't think that you can just expect this defense to improve like that. But I will say that I do expect them to be better. The defensive line specifically. We talked about Dan Hayes coming in from Pitt. That was a really good addition for Colorado. The, the Pitt transfer had 10 and a half sack tackles for loss, four sacks. I, I really like what he brings to the table. He is someone who can be disruptive. He can be explosive and someone who is, like I said, going to be a big time playmaker if everything works out. Because again, you're looking at a defense that needs to get better and that starts up front. Same thing with the offense. Everything starts up front and there's reason to be excited for sure. On the opposite side of him, BJ Green Initially committed to Washington, had a number of offers from other Power 5 co- uh, competition, or other Power 5 teams, ultimately chose Colorado over a bunch of those teams and you know decommitted from Washington to go to Colorado. So he is someone to keep an eye on there. The interiors where things really, to me, get interesting. We'll talk about depth in a little bit, but Pidozi and Wanko, like I said, when he's playing at his peak, there aren't many better defensive tackles in college football. And I don't think a lot of people know that because not a lot of people paid attention to Houston over the last couple of years. Not many people paid attention to his film, but Colorado obviously did. They liked what they saw. They know what he's capable of. Again, he is a bully in the trenches when he's playing really well. He is someone who has a ton of power for his frame and blocking him with one guy most of the time isn't going to work. But again, you have to stay healthy. You have to find ways to get on the field with so much competition. But again, at his peak, he's the best defensive tackle on this roster. Shane Coase comes back after a year in which you'd like to see a little bit more production from him, maybe a little bit more disruptive. Again, everything starts up front, and the defensive tackle position is going to be a question mark until further notice, so keep an eye on that group. Defensive end, though, we talked about Quincy Wiggins coming in from LSU, someone who has a lot of potential, and Colorado needs depth. Colorado needs guys to step up. Wiggins could be one of those guys. Samuel Okulala, we'll talk about more of him in a little bit. Productive player from Pitt. Could play on that defensive line. Could also play, probably will play the buck position. 
in, in the linebacker group. So we'll we'll go into them here real real quick. The linebackers have more potential than they did last year. I think there was a lot of question marks, even with the transfers that Sanders brought in. The linebackers weren't exactly a group that you thought highly of. Now, Okunwola is going to be a really fun player to watch at that buck position. Six tackles for loss, five sacks for Pitt last year. And I think that he is going to be a disruptive player for this defense. Levante Bentley, a second team all pack 12, according to College Football Network. Pretty good year, 68 tackles, 11 tackles for loss. And then there's Trevor Woods, probably the most slept on player on this defense, just because people don't talk about him a lot. But Trevor Woods is a solid player as well. 56 tackles. I uh, had, you know, a, a solid year in terms of being a playmaker. You know, and when you look at he had two interceptions, that knows what to do. And he's just going to probably fly under the radar because you have so many of these high profile guys coming in. Now, that being said, they're going to be pushed for time because guys like Keaton Wade, who comes in from Kentucky, Jalen Wester comes in from FAU, uh, Nikhil Webb Walker comes from New Mexico State. There are so many guys that are pushing for starting time, and these linebackers play a big role in this defense. They have to be better, and the linebackers are going to be a big reason why they will be better because there's so much talent on this in, in this position group, and that's going to make everyone better. That's going to make sure that this rotation doesn't see a drop off as certain players hit the field. And I, I think you have a lot of talented players, but again, you have to wait and see with Colorado because there's so many moving pieces. There's so many different things that we haven't seen yet. We don't know how these guys are going to play with each other. We don't know how they're going to communicate. We don't know what they're going to see and how they're going to move, fill gaps, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of moving pieces. That's going to take some time no matter what conference you're in. So this linebacker group is one to keep an eye on, but I think there's plenty of reason to be excited, especially more than last year. Same thing could be said about the secondary. Now, granted, you, you did have Shiloh, you know, Shiloh Sanders coming in, Travis Hunter coming in, Cameron Silman, Craig. You had guys coming in that were going to create excitement. But the two of the players that they added, and, and there's a couple more that we'll talk about, but getting DJ McKinney from Oklahoma State is one of the bigger additions uh, of anyone in terms of the cornerback position. I think that Colorado's ability to get McKinney was – I, I again still flying under the radar. That's how good it was. Six foot two, 190 pounds. Putting him opposite a hunter gives them a potential one of the best duos in college football. So that's going to be really exciting. Preston Hodge coming in from Liberty, another underrated transfer. I don't think a lot of people knew who Preston Hodge was until he committed to Colorado. And even then, I don't think a lot of people still know who he is. But he is someone that's going to be really fun to watch at the nickel position. And joining a group that's really talented. Travis Hunter, absolute dog. Just so fun to watch on both sides of the ball. He's really fun to watch on defense because he's not going to shy away from any matchup. He wants the best guy that's on the field. He wants the other team's best receiver. And that's going to, I think, bode well for him long term. That competitive spirit is going to help him. It's just going to come down to durability and his endurance. Can he handle this many snaps once again? Is he going to be capable of playing at a high level even when he's playing both sides? Last year we saw he's capable of doing it, and I'm excited to see him do it again. Cameron Simon Craig, to me, is one of the most underrated players on this team because Hunter and, and Shiloh Sanders get a lot of the spotlight, and it's easy to see why for different reasons for both of those guys. But Cameron Silman Craig is someone who is a natural playmaker, was that at Jackson State, then follows Dion to Colorado. And now you can see why he is going to be one of the more important players for Colorado this year. Again, this is a pass defense that was horrendous in 2023, but the experience they have coming back along with the talent that they've added makes this for to be a much better group this year. Depth pieces, though, this is where things get really interesting because Colton Hood comes in from Auburn. Savion Riley comes in from Vanderbilt. A former transfer, Travis J is back. And when you look at even Ivan Yates, the Furman transfer, could all be really good, could also be not super great either. But, again, the beauty of this is that you bring so much talent in, eventually you're going to get some, some hits. And I think the starting lineup, 
looks really good for Colorado. Again, just like the offense, moving pieces means that things are going to be uh, concerning. You're going to have to wait and see about chemistry for a little while. And we'll talk about the schedule and why that could be problematic. But at the same time, the talent level at least took a step forward. I think the talent level elevated for sure. And that's going to mean good things for Colorado. Now, when you look at what this team does really well, what they have that's good, what they have that's concerning, we talked about pretty much all of these already, but Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter are the easiest strengths of this team. Those are two of the easiest players to identify in terms of who's good. Teams, when they're we're talking about Colorado, game planning, those are the first two guys they're going to talk about. How do you negate those? How do you uh, thwart their efforts? And how do you take them away from what Colorado wants to do? Wide receiver is also going to be a strength. The depth, the, the ceiling, that's going to be a really good group. Now the concerns, here, here's the thing. Concerns could be a lot of things for Colorado, especially after four and eight season. You have to at least be realistic about that. But I think you can also still be optimistic, but chemistry is going to be the biggest one. When you bring in this much talent, you're establishing essentially a new culture every year because last year was obviously a huge culture shock to Colorado. And this year is not as much, but still very much a, a culture shock to a lot of these guys. And a lot of these playmakers are going to experience different things now. And you're bringing in different talent. And when you have guys around you, they haven't played with before. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't have that nonverbal communication of if I go in this gap, that means this guy's going over here. Or if I signal this, this guy knows what that means. And I, and we're switching to this. You don't know exactly how your guy runs your route, uh, which guy handles in, in terms of if there's a twist or a stunt, how does the offensive line handle? How does my guard handle if this guy is twisting out or if he's, you know, stunting on the inside? That's going to be a thing to keep an eye on. The offensive line also, until further notice, will be a question. That is going to be a concern until they prove otherwise. The defense is the X factor. If this defense can take a step forward, the offense doesn't need to be as good as it was last year, but it's still going to be a good group offensively. So you don't have to be too concerned. That being said, you need this defense to take a step forward. You simply cannot afford to do what you did last year. The schedule is where things really get interesting because this might be one of the most volatile teams conference wise uh, in, in the big 12. Uh, when you look at this schedule, you can talk yourself into a lot of wins, but you also have to keep it realistic. So to me, seven and five is probably the ceiling for this team, despite them being better. But again, after our four and eight season, seven and five would be incredible. The first game against NDSU, it's probably not the most ideal game to have if you're Colorado. NDSU, even though they're not the NDSU that we've seen in the past, it's still very much a tough team. This is a team that is competing for a national championship at the FCS level, a team notorious for upsetting FBS teams. Uh, Colorado has, this is where the chemistry really plays a, a role because NDSU's offense requires you to be disciplined, requires you to fill your gaps correctly, and requires you to do a lot of things that Colorado didn't necessarily do last year. If you are not careful, NDSU will walk into Colorado and come away with a win. That is a game that is honestly, I won't say it's a coin flip, but it's getting, it's going to be close to that because NDSU is that good, is that disciplined. And if Colorado is not careful, they're going to find themselves 0-1. But Again, I like where this team's going. The talent level, the ceiling for Colorado is higher than it is for NDSU simply because of the talent. So that ideally should be a win. At Nebraska and at Colorado State are two difficult games for various different reasons. Nebraska is going to be much better. So is Colorado State. Throwing the fact that last year, if you didn't watch Colorado, Colorado State, or you didn't appreciate that, then I would recommend going back and watching it because there were so many things about that game that made it great. There are so many things that made that super entertaining, and I expect both Nebraska and Colorado State to be good games once again. Then you go Baylor and then at UCF. Those are two, again, unique challenges. Baylor is looking to bounce back. UCF thinks that they can compete for a conference championship. So those are two teams that are going to give you 
different challenges for different reasons. And then the two game stretch of Kansas state and Arizona, that's really tough. Those are two teams that will be competing for the big 12 conference, a uh, conference title Cincinnati at home should be uh, the Cincinnati team is uh, also kind of rebuilding, but they're not bringing in nearly the talent that Colorado is. That should be a win. The last four games are, I won't lie. These are brutal at Texas tech, Utah at Kansas and Oklahoma state. Those could easily be four losses. So the floor for this team is two and 10. Simply put, you can lose 10 games if you're Colorado and you're not careful this year. We saw last year four and eight. Now two and 10 would obviously be an epic meltdown, but it's not out of the question. It's not a, a something where you look at the schedule and think, yeah, that's not possible. It's definitely possible. Because all of these games in the in the Big 12 are difficult. The fact that you get NDSU as one of your non-con games is not fun. The fact that you get Nebraska and Colorado State as the other two it is not easy. So winning games is going to be – it's going to come at a premium this year. Colorado is not going to just walk through this schedule and see that life is, is, is simple. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a dock fight. But does that focus – this team a little bit quicker than we expect we will see but one thing is for sure this is going to be a much better team than it was last year whether or not the record reflects that i'm not sure but i know this team will be better the talent level has been elevated the depth obviously is a concern the things that were concerning last year are once again concerns this year but i think they have some more answers than they did last year we'll see what happens we'll see what dion in this group can do but i'm telling you if they can find a way to improve and they already have this much attention, imagine what that's going to look like at the end of 2024.